emergency landing uh, here to the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, the crew of seven of the, of the uh, Space Shuttle Atlantis about to begin its mission, it appears, to the International Space Station, barring any last-minute technical glitches. And so far, it's been a countdown without any hitches. Less than uh, right about four minutes to go. Let's bring in Leroy Chow, veteran NASA astronaut, three times on the Space Shuttle, one time on a Russian Soyuz, six and a half months aboard the International Space Station. He's got a pretty good resume for an astronaut, I'd say. Leroy, good to have you with us. Let's walk through very quickly the uh, seven-man crew. It's an all-man crew, no women on this one. Uh, and right. let's begin at with the commander, Steve Frick. Commander uh, is a captain of the U.S. Navy. Tell me about him. Right, good to be back with you, Miles. And uh, Steve Frick, an experienced uh, flyer commanding Atlantis. Uh, I think she's in good hands. Steve's a good guy. Closure on that tragedy. Um, I personally did not have that, that kind of a thing happen, but uh, actually my wife's father did pass away the day uh, just, just before my launch, and I didn't find out about it till two days later after we got to the International Space Station. So uh, I know a little bit about what he, he's going through and what he went through, and it's, it's not easy. Okay, we're at about a minute and 40 seconds to launch. Let's uh, remind folks what's going on here. They're bringing the international to the International Space Station a key European laboratory module called Columbus. Uh, put that into some perspective, if you would, Leroy. That, that module is an important piece of the, of the whole pie here. You bet. And, uh, you know, that module is a key uh, piece of the International Space Station. It's the European laboratory. People have been working on it for decades, literally, and they're very excited, I'm sure, to see it finally go and, and get attached to the station. And uh, following that will be the GEM module, hopefully flying later in the year. And uh, that will complete the international components of the International Space Station and uh, really open up some real estate and some laboratory space to, to get some more research work done. Now, we're inside one minute here. Everything is going according to plan so far in the countdown. The Space Shuttle Atlantis ready, fueled, no technical glitches. You see just a light breeze here. We're, uh, let's listen for yeah, just a little bit uh, to George Diller, who is the public affairs officer here at the Kennedy Space Center. He'll be followed by Rob Navius, public affairs in Houston, as Atlantis is poised to begin its 29th mission, this one to the International Space Station. T minus 31 as seconds. Hand it off now to the onboard computers Atlantis of Atlantis. Onboard computers has occurred. Fifteen seconds. Range safety systems armed. Sound suppression system water activated. T minus ten. Nine. Eight. Go for main engine start. Seven. Six. Main engine ignition. Four. Three. And liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis as Columbus sets sail on a voyage of science to the space station. Houston now controlling. Roger, roll, Atlantis. Columbus weighs anchor from its port in Florida. Atlantis on the proper alignment, heads down, wings level for the eight and a half minute ride to orbit, taking aim on the International Space Station for docking on Saturday. 28 seconds into the flight. The three liquid fuel main engines soon will throttle back to 72% of rated performance, going in the bucket, reducing the stress on the shuttle as it breaks through the sound barrier. Atlantis, three miles in altitude, seven miles downrange. 50 seconds into the flight. Engines beginning to throttle back up, standing by for that call from Capcom Jim Dutton. Atlantis, go at throttle up. Atlantis copies, go at throttle up. Throttle up Seven million pounds of thrust combined between the uh, main engines of the Space Shuttle Atlantis and those solid rocket boosters, those twin cigarette-looking rockets that are attached to that orange external fuel tank. Leroy Chow, take us on board right now as this ride continues the first couple of minutes with those SRBs, those solid rocket boosters. It's quite a bumpy ride. You know you're going somewhere, don't you? Oh, absolutely. Right at booster ignition, there's a big kick in the back of your chair, and first stage is actually pretty uh, shaky. You get a lot of vibrations. It's difficult to focus your eyes on the screens and the gauges, and once those solids rock, 
that, uh, in fact, it was so dramatic during my first flight, Miles, I actually thought that uh, something was wrong. I thought maybe the engines had all stopped, and uh, only I quickly looked at the gauges, saw it was running, and everything was okay. Yeah, I've heard it described as uh, sort of the electric ride or something to that effect at <laughs> right. this point. Is that is that how you describe it? Yes, actually, it's, uh, you know, we've talked about it like electric engines, you know, something very smooth. Um, you know, and Soyuz is the same way because Soyuz is all liquid, and so there are no solid strap-ons, so you can't even feel li uh, lift-off on a Soyuz. Now, watching right now, I've been watching very closely to see if any of that foam has fallen off that external fuel tank, which, of course, takes us back to the other space shuttle disaster of Columbia in February of 2003. And that problem appears to be pretty well solved at this point, Leroy. I haven't seen anything fall off of there of any consequence. Right, I agree, Miles. I think uh, we uh, NASA really worked hard on that. The engineers at NASA and down at Michu assembly facility near New Orleans, and looks like they've got that problem licked. Uh, no major pieces have come off since then, and this one looks pretty clean to my, uh, just by looking at the monitor here. Of course, plenty of NASA folks will be watching the replays and making sure that no big pieces came off and struck the orbiter. Three minutes and 40 seconds into flight right now. The space shuttle continuing its acceleration. The crew uh, gradually, but ever so certainly, uh, feel should something happen, should they lose an engine. If it happens early on, they have to do an amazingly difficult procedure, never been tried, of course, to return to the launch site. The higher and faster they go, the more options they have for emergency landing sites, correct? That's, that's right, Miles, and you're right, the RTLS, the return to launch site aboard has never, thank goodness, had to been used, and uh, once you get up a little higher and a little faster, you've got options to go halfway around the world and land at a, a transatlantic abort site. Um, and if you go a little bit higher, you have the option to abort to orbit and get to a lower safe orbit and evaluate your fur further options at that point. I just got the call that is uh, pressed to ATO, Leroy, which uh, it translated into lay terms, means if they lose an engine at this point, they would go to orbit, the abort to orbit. And that's, a, that's an important uh, milestone as they climb out of this, uh, out of gravity and into space, isn't it? Yes, at the abort to orbit, that's a, you know, you breathe even easier at that point because you know that you've got uh, if even if you lost an engine, you've got two good engines can carry you to orbit. Once you get into orbit, you've got a little time to sort out the problem and figure out your options. So that's a that's an important call. At this point, the crew doesn't really have any sensation of uh, speed. I imagine as they roll at this point. Uh, in order for the um, communications devices on the space shuttle to communicate with satellites above us as they begin that roll, they don't have any sensation of speed, do they? That's correct, Miles. Uh, on my first flight, I was on the flight deck of Columbia, and I had a mirror and I could look out through the mirror, I could look through the overhead windows. And so right after launch, as the shuttle heeled over on its back, I could see the acceleration, I could see the ground rushing by. Uh, we didn't do the roll to heads up uh, at that time back in the shuttle program, but if we had, you're right, suddenly you would lose all your visual, visual references to, uh, to the speed. Now we're about six and a half minutes into this flight, and one of the key issues we've been talking about in the run-up to this flight are the fuel gauges, those eco sensors, engine right. cutoff sensors. And one of the important things is that uh, those three main engines, which the shuttle is running on right now, don't ever run dry or run out of gas because there could be a catastrophic failure if that does happen. Those sensors uh, were bulky. There was all kinds of problems with them. They finally soldered all the pins and connectors together. Everything seems to be working well, but there was an insistence on the part of astronauts that those eco sensors work and they understand that problem. It, it sounds like they licked that one as well. Yeah, I'm glad to see that uh, the problem seems to be solved. Uh, they had four good sensors uh, for the last couple of minutes. They've been under that stress. Um, it's really not too bad. It just, just takes a little bit more effort to breathe. It feels like someone's sitting on your chest. And then suddenly at main engine cutoff, you'll be weightless and you'll get that forward tumbling sensation. Of course, you're not really tumbling, but that's kind of what it feels like. And then suddenly everything that's tethered will start floating up. Your pencil, if you kind of let it dangle, will kind of float up in front of you, and uh, you know you're in space. Eight minutes and 15 seconds in, in about 15 seconds, we're going to see that orange solid tank separate from the space shuttle. The camera you're seeing is on the external fuel tank. You'll see the shuttle burn a uh, uh, quick kind of uh, explosion of bolts and off they go. Um, I got to ask you, Leroy, when you've had that tumbling feeling, the first time at least, or did you ever feel sick? No, actually, uh, you know, I do well going into space. I'm one of the lucky guys that doesn't have any symptoms going into space. There's that separation, by yep, the way. there it is right there. And anyway, can, and can, at this point, 
They're that, feeling zero G and, and that tumbling effect, huh? Right, but the tumbling effect is very brief. And uh, it's just kind of right at the moment of main engine cutoff, you get a little bit of that tumbling effect. Uh, you're well briefed on it, so you're, you're expecting it. And it's not that big a deal, but uh, the first time you're in weightlessness, it sure is a different feeling. You know, you see everything floating. Visually, it's different. Um, and of course, uh, first time you unstrap and float it, you'd, I felt almost giddy with uh, exhilaration. Leroy Chow, you sure know how to talk a shuttle into orbit. What a spectacular shot we're looking at there right now. Absolutely the beautiful. The sun pointed in that camera. I mean, it's hard to imagine we're watching a fuel tank um, traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, and we're watching it like it's next door. It really is amazing. It is amazing. This picture is incredibly clear and just a testament to, to the hard work of uh, NASA and the contractors of getting the problem solved and getting cameras on board that give us these high-res images.